Homocysteine increases during aging, and that's what we'll see here. On the y-axis, we've got plasma levels of homocysteine plotted against age, and this is from 12-year-olds all the way up to older than 80-year-olds. In youth, average homocysteine values for women and men are around 6 to 7 micromolar. Homocysteine then increases during aging, such that at older ages, older than 80 years old, average homocysteine is 11 to 12 micromolar. Now, the importance of that age-related increase for homocysteine is that relatively higher levels are associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk, or ACM risk. And that's what we'll see here. This is a meta-analysis of six studies that included almost 28,000 people. On the y-axis, we've got relative risk, so this is risk of death for all causes, plotted against circulating levels of homocysteine, HCY. In terms of what's significant, we put up a red line at a hazard ratio of 1, when the dashed black lines are completely above one, as in this case, or below one in other studies, that's a significant association. So we can see that even at very low levels of homocysteine, all-cause mortality risk or risk of death for all causes significantly increases as homocysteine increases, even from values as low as one to two micromolar. So together, these data suggest that lower is better for homocysteine and avoiding the age-related increase uh, may be important for minimizing risk of death for all causes. Now, if you're familiar with the channel, homocysteine has been a weak spot as it's been close to age expected for many tests. So with that in mind, what's my data? And let's take a look at that story. So I first started tracking homocysteine in 2005. And over the past 20 years or so, I have 41 blood tests as shown here. Homocysteine on the y-axis plotted against age. So in my early to mid-30s, average homocysteine was relatively youthful at 7.1 micromolar. And then unfortunately, I took about 10 years off for measuring it. I just didn't, I was measuring other stuff or I couldn't afford it at the time. I don't remember why I, I stopped measuring it. But then around six years ago, I started testing it, adding it back into the approach as I realized this is important. I better start measuring it again. And over the past six years or so, 35 tests, average homocysteine has been 10.3 micromolar which is close to age expected, which if you're familiar with the channel, these are dirty words in my approach. I don't want to be age expected for anything. Everything should be as close to youthful as possible. Now, rather than just looking at uh, two averages between two different periods, when using a two sample t-test, these two groups of data are significantly different as that p-value is less than 0.05. In other words, I've had an age-related increase for homocysteine. So how can I reduce it? How can I reduce homocysteine? And I can all, already hear you in the comments saying, just take TMG, trimethylglycine or betaine. That'll do the trick. I've tried it, but let's check out the data. So in terms of being able to reduce homocysteine, let's take a look at homocysteine metabolism, which is shown here. Now, homocysteine is in the middle and we can increase dietary intake of betaine. So foods contain betaine like beets, but other foods too. Now, we can also supplement, right? We can take TMG, trimethylglycine, or otherwise known as betaine, and with the goal of reducing homocysteine because as you can see on this chart, homocysteine combines with betaine to form methionine, also forming dimethylglycine with a methyl group transfer from betaine uh, in the process, thereby reducing circulating levels of homocysteine. Now, this, this is the theoretical for what can happen. And I can say in my case, I haven't made a YouTube video about it, but pre-YouTube, I had a blog. And I documented the biohacking journey on the blog. And one of those uh, experiments was four grams per day of trimethylglycine. It didn't make a dent on homocysteine. And I'll link, I'll link to that blog post from years before the YouTube channel existed. I, I'll link to that in the video's description. Now, there are other ways we can potentially reduce homocysteine. And that includes by increasing dietary intake of folic acid, which increases serum folate in conjunction with vitamin B12, converts homocysteine into methionine. Now, again, rather than focus on, focusing on what can happen, remember, I track my diet every day, weighing all my food, logging it into chronometer, putting it into an Excel spreadsheet, and then looking at correlations for diet with biomarkers after every test. So I can look at correlations for folate, B12, and other nutrients with homocysteine to see if they're making a dent, potentially making a dent, or at least correlated with them, you know, because we, we can't say about causation. But if they're not correlated, I can't imagine they would be making it a causative dent. Nonetheless, folate in my data, 35 tests for folate intake lined up with homocysteine, not significantly correlated. You can see that p-value is greater than 0.05, so it's at 0.13. Granted, the correlation is in the right direction, but it's outside of significance.
In contrast, vitamin B12 is significantly correlated with lower homocysteine in my data. As you can see that the R, the correlation coefficient, is negative 0.54. So in other words, a relatively higher uh, intake of vitamin B12 is significantly correlated with lower homocysteine. That's what that correlation suggests. And the p-value is far below 0.05 at 0.0009. So that's an easy answer, right? Just supplement with vi uh, vitamin B12 or methyl B12, which is what, what which was what I was doing up to a thousand micrograms or one milligram per day. Just take high dose methyl B12, problem solved, right? Well, the goal isn't to just optimize one biomarker and then make others worse. First, the, the, the challenge is actually investigating if there's an, a correlative impact on other biomarkers. And I do that after every test. And when running that analysis, the net correlative score for vi vitamin B12 intake is minus three. In other words, a relatively higher intake of vitamin B12 in my data is significantly correlated with lower homocysteine, but it's also significantly correlated with four other biomarkers going in the wrong direction in terms of how they change during aging or their association with all-cause mortality risk. So I'm not interested in improving one biomarker and, and potentially making four others worse. And again, notice I say potentially because these are correlations and I can't say about causation. I have tried lower doses of vitamin B12, uh, 500 micrograms per day, 300 micrograms per day, but those don't make a dent on homocysteine. So it seems like it's either go high, you know, 1,000 micrograms per day for vitamin B12, potentially mess up other biomarkers or get no effect. So Vitamin B12 is kind of a, a, a no-go for me at this point. There are other ways, though, potentially to reduce homocysteine, though, and those include uh, the amino acid serine in com combination with vitamin B6 as they help convert homocysteine into cystathionine. And then in the presence of adequate B6, cystathionine is converted into cysteine, which is potentially important because cysteine can be incorporated into GSH or glutathione. Both cysteine and glutathione decline during aging. So I spent a few tests trying to increase, or I increased serine intake up to six grams per day while trying to drag, <laughs> drag homocysteine towards this pathway rather than going towards methionine, which may be bad for our, you know, longevity based on methionine restriction studies. But nonetheless, high dose serine up to six grams per day didn't make a dent on homocysteine. More specifically, vitamin B6 is not significantly correlated with homocysteine in my data, as shown there, p-value greater than 0.05. What about increasing intake of other methyl donors? So betaine, or trimethylglycine, that means that the nitrogen atom on glycine, the amino acid glycine, has three methyl groups. But that's not the only amino acid that has three methyl groups attached to its nitrogen atom. Others include proline betaine and tryptophan betaine. And also, as a potential methyl donor, although it's not an amino acid, trigonelline, which is otherwise known as 1-methylnicotinic acid, can also potentially act as a methyl donor. So I've, I've experimented with increasing intake of each of these potential methyl donors with no impact on homocysteine. So it would seem I'm out of luck, right? Well, for whatever reason, I had the thought, maybe something in my diet is causing hom higher homocysteine. So what could that be? Maybe mushrooms. So mushrooms are a great source of ergothionine and spermanine. And that's important because both of those metabolites increase lifespan in mice. So with that in mind, I've been keeping mushroom intake relatively high with an average of about 250 grams per day for many tests. But also note that mushrooms also contain nicotinamide. And I know that because if they contain nicotinic acid, I'd expect my NAD levels to be on the higher side, not age expected or lower. So that suggests that the niacin that's contained in mushrooms is most likely nicotinamide. So why is that important? Nicotinamide increases homocysteine. And this is in a randomized controlled trial. This is a human study. Plasma levels of homocysteine were measured up to three hours after people were dosed with nicotinamide. And then as we'll see in a minute, uh, nicotinic acid or water as a control. So when people took 300 milligrams of nicotinamide, an hour and a half after that, homocysteine levels, plasma levels of homocysteine increased from 11 micromolar to 16, and three hours later were up to 18 micromolar. It's a pretty big jump. That's in comparison with water as a control, where you can see that there was no change in plasma levels of homocysteine. And then fortunately in this study, they also tried nicotinic acid, same dose, 300 milligrams, uh, 300 milligram dose. And although you can see that there was a small increase for homocysteine, it was only up to from about 11 to 12 uh, micromolar and nowhere near as close to the increase for homocysteine as nicotinamide. 
Now, also as another side note, note that most of us in this community are taking nicotinic acid or nicotinamide with the goal of increasing NAD. In my case, a far lower dose of nicotinic acid increases NAD. As low as 50 milligrams per day gets the same NAD raising effect as 300 milligrams of nicotinamide. So that, that suggests that I may not get any increase for homocysteine at that relatively lower dose of nicotinamide while getting an NAD boost. So now we can return to our question and see, is mushroom intake re related to homocysteine? I, we can more directly assess that as I track diet in conjunction with biomarkers. And I have 27 tests where the diet lines up with homocysteine as I've been tracking food intake since 2018. And that's what we can see here with plasma levels of homocysteine on the y-axis plotted against the average daily mushroom intake on the x. And then we can see a significant positive strong correlation, strong being defined as a correlation coefficient greater than 0.7. So here we've got 0.72. So a significant positive strong correlation between mushroom intake with homocysteine. In other words, when my mushroom intake has been at its highest level, that's significantly correlated with higher levels of homocysteine. So is mushroom intake related to homocysteine? We can see with that check, it is. Now to test that correlation, I then cut a mushroom intake from test number four to test number five from 250 grams per day to 95 grams per day. And you can see that data point, it looks like an outlier. That, that green line is no other, no other homocysteine data in conjunction with mushroom intake has been in that ballpark. In other words, this looks like an outlier relative to all my other mushroom intake as it's lower. But also note that that 8.9 micromolar that corresponds to this test where I cut mushroom intake is in the same ballpark as the data on the right, which I was able to obtain. And these are relatively lower values on average compared to the mushroom intake values on the right. I was only able to obtain the lower homocysteine values on the left with high dose, greater than 500 micrograms per day of vitamin B12. And mushrooms for those tests were zero. So what the mushroom cut from 250 to 95 grams per day suggests is that I might be able to get in the ballpark of a homocysteine reduction as if I'm taking methyl donors, although I was not supplementing with any methyl donors for this test. Now there is a potential confounder to this story and it involves protein intake because as shown there, protein intake in my data is significantly correlated with lower homocysteine. In other words, when protein intake has been higher, homocysteine has been lower. Correlation. Now for this test, protein intake was increased by about 15 grams per day. So is it the mushroom cut and lower nicotinamide that made a dent? Is it the higher protein intake that made a dent? I don't know. Both of those may be involved. So to test that, for the next test, the, I've cut protein intake down from the 112 grams per day where it was on average for test number five to back to 95 to 100 grams per day where it was prior to test number five. And I've kept mushrooms at 95 grams per day. So by bringing protein intake down, if homocysteine stays at nine micromolar or less, that would suggest that it might have been the mushrooms and too much nicotinamide that was increasing my homocysteine. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got a whole bunch of affiliate and discount links that you can use to test yourself while helping to support the channel, including Ulta Labs, epigenetic testing, NAD quantification, oral microbiome composition, at-home metabolomics, at-home blood testing with Cyfox Health, which includes ApoB, but also Grimage, diet track, uh, green tea, sorry, diet tracking with chronometer, or if you'd like to uh, support the channel, you can do that with the website, buy me a coffee. We've also got merch, so if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Diet Trying brand, as I've got on here, that link and all of the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.